This is Tokens. I'm Lee C. Camp. Everybody has walked through hell and loss and tragedy, and it's a miracle that we're all able to function in light of all of that. That's Drew Holcomb, Nashville-based Americana singer-songwriter and frontman of the band Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors. Sometimes artists have to take a chance to be vulnerable. On today's episode, Drew does a bit of that chance-taking, talking about how his music has in some instances been a response to some of his frustrations with American evangelicalism. And he shares some of his own vulnerabilities and some of the stories behind two of his most beautiful songs, Dragons, an anthem-like call to courage, and You Never Leave My Heart, a ballad on the joyful life and tragic loss of Drew's brother. All of my music has sort of been framed a little bit by his life and his death. Plus, live performances from Drew on both of those songs from our sessions at Nashville's famed Sound Emporium. All this coming right up. Grateful to have Drew Holcomb with us, singer, songwriter, musician, frontman for the band Drew Holcomb. <laughs> Memphian. Memphian, that's right. By birth. Nashville, how long now? Oh, uh, 15 years? 15, yeah. yes. Basically an adopted son now, I Yes, think. that's right. Yeah. You and I both have kind of slipped in under the... We're not the new crowd in Nashville anymore. That's right. Yeah, we've yeah. been around long enough to be kind of Nashvilleian. Yeah. But welcome. Glad to have you back. Thanks for having me. Great Glad to, to be have on. you. Really is. Rolling Stone recently dubbed you something like an Americana hero. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun one. Yes. Yeah. It's fun to be validated by something you've read since you were a kid. Uh, yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah. That's got to feel kind of sweet, I would imagine, after all the hard work that goes into doing the kind of work you do. Yeah, it is. You try not to, especially as you get older, let those sort of benchmarks and milestones be too much of a, of a identity sort of possession. But it is still nice and you're yeah. grateful for it when that kind of thing happens. Right. That article kind of, you know, done a lot of interviews over the years, a lot of articles with different publications. That one kind of made the rounds, which was, uh, it's always surprising to me when people find me through that sort of thing. Yeah. But that's definitely happened with that piece. Yeah. Do you, or how do you deal with, I, I, I'm, I'm speculating, so correct me guys. No, I don't want to put any kind of words in your mouth and not presume that I know anything like what your experience is like, but I would assume from what I know about the life of singer songwriters and creative types in Nashville, that it can often be a long, hard slog and take a long time to get people, as many people knowing about what you're doing as you want. So there's that sort of naturally humbling part of the process, I would suppose on the one hand. Yeah. And then once you get to a place of where kind of you are in your career, lots of people are knowing what you're doing. And then there's the temptation of vanity on that side. Right. So what's that experience like for you between the, frustration and potential sense of humiliation and vanity on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I came to where we, you know, I, we came to where we are now through years of hard work, but also lots of moments of sort of blind luck or, you know, blind providence, whatever, you know, things are outside of our control, however you want to frame that. But, you know, I've always been a dreamer, but always, also had quite a bit of a pragmatic spirit. And so from the get go, my main marker of whether or not to keep going was, am I paying my bills? And is there a little bit left over to keep dreaming with, <laughs> you know, and was fortunate to have the right people at the right time kind of come alongside me in various ways and various seasons of this, you know, 16 year journey, but also had the benefit of being surrounded by people I've, I've known for a long time professionally, like my guitar player, Nathan, he and I came up together. A lot of the people that I'm still surrounded with sort of live through those barren, try hard every day, mostly fail years. Yeah. You can't really get away with too much when you're surrounded by people who've been through the same thing you yeah, have. Yeah. And then we were given some great advice. There's a counselor named Al Andrews that a lot of Nashville artists know yeah. and have, have been to. And I uh, said, Al, you've been counseling musicians and artists for 20 years. Do you have like one big takeaway? 
He said, oh, yeah, it's easy. The human heart was not built for notoriety. <laughs> And, uh, well, those are those are foreboding, potentially foreboding words. Yeah, they were, but they also <laughs> sort of like gave me like a nice, solid anchor. Yeah, you know, because it is really easy to sort of live and die by the highs and lows of like, yeah, we sold out the whatever venue, and it was an amazing night, and everybody's screaming and they love the songs, and you know, it's like definitely a high, and the lows of like, no one cares about this record, and <laughs> people forgot about the last tour. This one's not going as well, and. It's easy to sort of live in those like high peaks, low valleys. And we've tried to sort of like come off of a great show and be like, man, that was great. I'm grateful for that. But that doesn't identify me. That's not like who I am. And then the same thing when you go like to the big disappointment and not sort of stay down in that valley. Yeah. But to still acknowledge that like one's really great and the other's really hard. Somewhere recently I'd read, and I don't know where this comes from, but, uh, kind of spiritual practice of regularly saying to yourself that is past or that just concluded. <laughs> That's great. And just regularly being aware of every moment passes, you know, and it passes and it's done. Yeah, that's right. And another another one that's related to that that I've liked a lot is I read about this monk who used to have this favorite coffee mug. Every time he would drink out of it, he would say, it is already broken. Huh. And so there's part of that that you could read as kind of pessimism. But on the other hand, it's like a sort of acceptance of this is the way life is. Yeah. You know? And good things come and you can enjoy them and then they go. Yeah, I love that. So one of the things, I don't know how many of your listeners know this about you, but it's been one of the things that I've always found fascinating about you is that uh, you have a master's in theology from St. Andrews University. And also in your undergrad, you did a lot of history and religious studies. Yep. How do you see those disciplines factoring into your work, particularly when you're not a contemporary Christian artist, you're an Americana artist. Yeah. Well, I sort of see all of popular music as sort of spiritual reckoning, you know, when mm. thinking about artists like Ray Charles, you know, who grew up singing in a church or Springsteen who grew up in like a strict Catholic background or, you know, all of the religious imagery and Dylan's music or, you know, you can't really separate popular music from sacred music in, in the sense of, of their sort of historical connection to each other. And so the history connection for me was always just like, I loved narrative. I loved connecting cause and effect and how things came to be. So I've always been a little bit of a sort of backward thinker or past driven thinker, wanting to understand the present moment through the lens of the past. I think it's a really like helpful tool for understanding life. And I always found that you can't separate Western history from religious history, you know, right. Theology drives practice, you know, throughout, especially sort of Western European and American history. And so I always saw those two things sort of as one interchangeable practice was sort of studying those two things. But I went to seminary mainly because that was my original plan was to become Hmm sort of a religious studies teacher, history teacher. If you'd asked me through college, what are you going to be doing in your 20s and 30s? I'd be, I'm working on a PhD somewhere, mm. writing and hopefully landing in an academic job. And music was sort of a side hustle. Music had been like a really important part of my own personal life and personal journey through some difficult things that I'd walked through in my later teenage years. And so music was sort of the practice of my theological sort of conundrums that I found myself in and trying to find God. And so that, I found that same thing happening in music, starting from the, the stuff I liked that was the oldest stuff, which was like my parents loved, you know, 60s radio, mm. and then all the way up to listening to U2 and David Gray and Radiohead in high school. So I felt like those things were all sort of running on parallel tracks in my life. Yeah. So being married to Ellie Bannister – who is committed to contemporary Christian genre and you in the Americana genre, what kind of conversations do y'all have with each other about what you're doing? Yeah. Well, Ellie sort of ran from the idea of doing music from a very early age. She grew up around it. She felt like it was not where she wanted to be career wise. And so when she always swore she'd never marry a musician, (laughs) she did obviously. (laughs) So, 
No, she married someone who was going to seminary. That's, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's probably what she thought. I mean, I was already doing music, but she thought, I think at the time we thought it was just a diversion for a yeah. couple of years. So she was a school teacher. I, I convinced her after we got married to join my band. And she started writing songs three or four years in. She was supposed to be writing songs for our band. At the time, we were kind of a bar band. I mean, that's where mm-hmm. we played was like, you know, bars, like covered charge kind of, I mean, it was original music, but it was like, you know, smoky bars. So it was nothing like what she sort of grew up around with contemporary Christian music. But the songs she was writing were very sort of confessional in a way that sort of lent itself towards the CCM world in her own sort of folky way. And we kind of came to this head where it's like, you're writing these great songs. Like, you need to do your own thing, hmm. you know? And so that's kind of what happened. And, you know, she was like the first, I think she was the first independent artist to win, like, you know, a Dove New Artist of the huh. Year. So she still never really, like, got into the commercial, like, hub of CCM music and has kind of existed around it and on the edges of it in the way that she really enjoys sort of being in charge of her own schedule and her own life and, that's worked well for me. So when we talk about music, we both create very differently, whether and not even necessarily in terms of content, but just like Ellie's a sort of melody first writer. Mm. I'm a lyric first writer. You know, we've gotten to the point now we only write songs together if we know who's in charge of the writing session. Huh. So it's like, what are we writing for? And it's like, okay, we're writing for Ellie's record. Okay, Ellie's in charge. And I'm just here to yeah, yeah. help. And then vice versa. Yeah. But otherwise, we sort of just have good, solid marriage fights about yeah. songwriting. So, <laughs> uh, there's just a lot of mutual respect for each other, each other's creativity, and also sort of staying out of each other's lane. Yeah. And that's been a helpful thing for us. Yeah. So when you think about bringing to bear theological insight into songwriting, You've certainly had elements in your music where it seems like sometimes you're shooting a shot over the bow of <laughs> American evangelicalism. I mean, for example, yeah, from Ring the Bells. Um, <laughs> Ring the Bells, this time I mean it, bid the hatred fare thee well. Give back the pieces of my Jesus, take your counterfeit to hell. Yeah. I mean, that's a clearly... That wasn't really as so much a shot across the bow as I was aiming directly for the hole of the boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so talk to me about the anger or the frustration or the process by which you finally give vent to a lyric like that. Yeah. I was in Los Angeles with my friends Abner and Amanda Ramirez from Johnny Swim. Who by, I'm proud to say that the first time they ever played the Ryman was on a token show. Was it really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, they're wonderful people. Yeah, they're great folks. And they've made a lot of return visits to the Ryman since then, I, yeah. I guess. So we were good friends and we decided to write together. And it just happened to be scheduled that when I went was two days after the Charlottesville white supremacy gatherings mm. and tragedy there. So we were just angry about some public statements by some pretty powerful evangelicals sort of trying to downplay the events of that moment and also trying to sort of equivocate you know, what happened there, the, the whole both sides sort of mentality. Yeah, I felt like and still feel like the church that I grew up in and love has given itself away to some idols in the last, maybe always, you know, but I've seen it sort of in the last, you know, decade as being sort of a watershed moment where people of my generation and younger f- find it harder and harder to continue to sort of stay in the family of evangelicalism, which in some ways I think is okay. Like Ellie and I, you know, we go to an Anglican church and we find the sort of, this is our way, not this is the way Mm -hmm. as a helpful sort of way of, of being a a believer in the sort of red God, blue God churches that exist, you know, lowercase C. Right. Yeah. When you continue to look at that sort of tumult in the socio-political context in which we find ourselves, what to you are things that you're especially paying attention to that continue to frustrate you and or what are things you see that give you some sort of hope? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll start with the 
things that frustrate me. I think that the sort of conservative evangelical base has uh, led in to, like the primary motivating factor for public engagement is fear, uh, mm-hmm. fear of a place at the table being lost, fear of ways of life being, you know, threatened. And so therefore things like truth takes a backseat to sort of maintenance and survival of power. On the other hand, I see like it's a better time for my daughter ever to be alive than ever before, Hmm. you know, as far as the opportunities that are available to her. I see that as a really positive thing. I I see people like Beth Moore stepping out into these incredible leadership vacuums and speaking truth to the world. People that I would not have expected to sort of fulfill that role. Mm -hmm. Thinking of her as a kid, just like as this like woman who wrote these Bible studies that, you know, my mom and her friends loved. So I think that the idol of sort of America being like the great last hope of the world has sort of been done away with. Not that America is not a great, you know, actor in some ways, but it's obviously more complicated than I think everybody agrees with that. And I think that's okay. I think there's more opportunity for people who want to be honest about the complexity of the world, the complexity of our sort of interrelated guilts and opportunities. It's never been a better time to sort of lean into those sort of things and, um, tear down and then rebuild in a better version. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity there. I find it a really fascinating time to be a parent, also a difficult time to be a parent. It's a really busy time. Social media, yeah, yeah. globalization, race relations, political upheaval, you know, a lot of things to pay attention to all at once. Yeah. And we're gonna trip and fall and fail and right. rise, but bear witness to it no matter what, you know? Yeah. You are listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, and the Good Life. We're most grateful to have you joining us. If you have not yet done so, please subscribe today to the Tokens podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And let us know where you're listening from and some of the things you'd like to hear more about. Email us at podcast at tokenshow.com. Also, remember you can sign up for our email list or find out how to join us for a live event all at tokenshow.com. This is our interview with Americana singer-songwriter Drew Holcomb. Coming up, we hear about the stories of loss, hope, and courage, which inspired two beautiful moving songs from his latest record, as well as live performances from Drew of both said songs. These were performed alongside our incredible all-star ensemble of Nashville players during our recent sessions at Nashville's Sound Emporium. Part two in just a moment. Welcome back to Tokens and our interview with Americana singer-songwriter Drew Holcomb. During this segment, Drew and I discussed two of the most moving songs, I think, from his most recent album. The first is the title track, Dragons, an anthemic call to bravery and magnanimity, all sorts of grit and passion and living life at large. This is Drew's performance for us in the studio that day alongside a world-class ensemble, Scott Mulvihill, Sierra Hull, Brian Sutton, Aubrey Haney, Chris Brown, and Jeff Taylor. And of course, I weaseled myself into singing some vocals on the refrain. I was climbing a mountain Asleep in the moonlight The ghost of my grandpa Came to me in a dream As the stars hung above us He started singing this chorus He laughed loud as heaven said this to me take a few chances a few worthy romances go swimming in the ocean on new year's day don't listen to the critics stand up and bear witness go slay all the dragons that stand in your We stayed up and talked till the sunrise A war and love and sorrow He said stop spending all your money On forgiveness of sins Today is all you promised Don't trouble with tomorrow He faded into the forest Proudly singing this hymn Take a few chances A few worthy roads Swimming in the ocean on New Year's Day Don't listen to the critics Stand up and bear witness Go 
by lightning all my windows were open and I let the rain flood in the past felt like the present the future uncertain I sang like a sparrow lost in the wind take a few chances a few worthy romances go swimming in Listen to the critics Stand up and bear witness Go slay all the dragons That stand in your way Go slay all the dragons That stand in your way Go slay all the dragons That stand in your way I have found myself repeatedly playing your dragons song. Yeah. And this chorus, take a few chances, a few worthy romances, go swimming in the ocean on new year's day. Don't listen to the critics stand up and bear witness. Go slay all the dragons that stand in your way. What, what about your life leads you to such a lyric? <laughs> you know, I'm a, I've always been a little bit of a contrarian and so framing some of those things about slaying dragons, bearing witness, swimming the ocean on New Year's Day, obviously something that's like a, a discomfort. Yeah. <laughs> but proving to yourself that you have that some you sort of, yeah. you know, power over, <laughs> over, over death. You know, it's like, <laughs> these are all like ways to try to beat death a little yes. bit, you know. So the song originally sort of started out as this, I had the lyric about go slay all the dragons that stand in your way. There was a friend of mine who's in a different band. He called doing shows like you know being on stage call it slaying dragons mm. you know don't forget your slaying dragons up there mm. both for yourself and then hopefully for the audience yeah you know, beating fear you know all those sort of things so that's where the song sort of started and then i wrote it with uh, my friend zach williams from the lone bellow mm. and we both had these larger than life grandfather figures mm. and so the conversation was about that and sort of built the song as this sort of dreamscape of encountering the ghost of your grandfather while you're on a camping trip. And it was just a nice like medium for some of these sort of like, you know, rally cry lyrics that in the wrong context could be maybe even a little like cheesy, you know, but in the right context coming right. from your ghost of your grandfather. Right. It's pretty like, yeah, man, yeah. you know, I need to dust myself up off the floor and get back on the horse. And go out and get it. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the reasons that I, resonate so much with that and people listening to the podcast would have heard me say this too many times already but years ago teaching ethics classes you know i, I started realizing if my students don't have the courage yeah. it doesn't matter if they know the right thing to do that's a, that's great yeah and then to realize that you know in the great ancient virtue traditions courage was one of the four cardinal virtues you know if you don't have this one then you can't really make much progress with any of the rest of them yeah and that's um, really good. So I love that's this picture of, in my sense, you know, courage is central to all of this stuff that you're singing about. There. Yeah. 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 And there's also like a bit of legacy sort of like if you speak it about yourself, maybe it'll, you'll like step into it. Yeah. As you know, the aspirational, the aspirational kind of. side of like, you know, I know that as I've had kids and as they start to become more and more these independent versions of themselves as a sort of learn who they are. One of the things I, I sort of selfishly want more than anything is long term is I want their respect. Hmm. You know, you speak it for them, but also like I want to live this out as an example to you. Yeah. You know, one of the lines though kind of came from a funny story, the a few worthy romances. When <laughs> I was 15, my grandfather took me to my girlfriend's house for her birthday. 
and I had three presents and uh, he drops me off about six o'clock and her mom's going to cook us dinner and then we're going to watch a movie and he's going to come back and get me at nine 30. And so he drops me off and uh, got my presents and he's like, all right, have fun. I'll see you at nine 30. Sure enough, nine 30 rolls around and he rolls up in his old beat up Cadillac and I get back in the car and he backs out of the driveway and we're about a hundred yards from the house. And he said, well, did you give her those presents? I said, yes, sir. I did. He goes, you get you some kisses <laughs> and i said no sir i didn't and he slams on the brakes <laughs> and he goes get back in there and get those presents <laughs> and then he just obviously was kidding he took off driving and just laughed <laughs> la- like that whole laugh loud as heaven you know <laughs> yeah, he was so yeah. proud of himself he just ah, 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 ah. <laughs> so that's where that that's where that line came from that's pretty great take a few chances Few worthy romances go swimming in the ocean on New Year's Day. Also on that album, You Never Leave My Heart. Yeah, so I'm uh, the second of four kids. Brother born after me, the third child, was born with pretty severe spina bifida. He was paralyzed from about the sternum down, was in a wheelchair his whole life. 25, 28 major surgeries in 13 and a half years. We lived a really wonderful life, even in spite of all of his troubles. Had just a wonderful personality and people loved him. And I had trouble sort of writing music about him, even though all of my music has sort of been framed a little bit by his life and his death. He died summer between my junior and senior year. And it was actually a, quite a surprise. I was living in the Dominican Republic uh, all summer doing like summer long mission and and Spanish immersion program thing. So years later, started writing songs. I did write one song about him that was on my first record, solo record called Washington Blue. But fast forward 14, 15 years later, I had not really ever written anything else about him directly. And the way that grief tends to hit me with him, especially as I've gotten farther and farther away from his death, is that I'll just be doing something really normal and something will trigger a memory or an emotion and it just sort of overwhelms me. And so early January, 2019, we lived down the street from the post office where we get our mail. And so I went up there to get the mail. It was coming home. It was really cold, classic sort of Nashville January night. And the lyrics of the song is basically the story of what happened. So I was there and this cold wind sort of, blew my mind back to the party gathering, you know, whatever you want to call it after the funeral, hundreds, dozens, how many people, I don't know, were at the house with food and telling stories and all of this. And so I basically just kind of encountered that gathering in the song and then landed back on the sidewalk in East Nashville in the cold, Hmm. went home and just went to be alone and just wept, you know, sort of, deep 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 grief you know that even hits me what that would have been 20 years after the fact so ellie had somewhere to be that night we got the kids down she didn't really know what was going on and i just sat in the kitchen and wrote the song at basically as it is now and uh played it for ellie when she got home sent sort of a voice memo of it to my parents had to give them a warning you know my my other siblings claire and sam my parents hamp and nancy the five of us share a really like a uh, significant bond I think from his life and experiencing his death together. And so anytime there's something that happens to any of us related to that grief, we tend to try to share it because most of the people in my life don't know my brother. Ellie never met him. My kids obviously don't know him. My brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, most of my close friends. And so it's sort of a window into that grief I love the song. I only really performed it on this one tour. I just decided because it's sort of, you know, it's an intense song. And so I didn't know if I I would have it in me to do it, but I I ended up having it. So I was glad to do it, but I I don't think I'll tour that song much anymore. Sort of a moment in time. I've told you that I was there the night you sang it the first time in public at the Ryman. That's right. As I recollect, there was a story in the Nashville scene before that show, I think, that maybe told about some of the background of the song. Mm -hmm. And 
my wife, Laura, and I and some friends from out of town, we were center balcony, four or five rows back, and your parents were down on the front row down in front of us. And the banisters were there as well. And, um, you know, the Ryman has lots of holy moments. But this was definitely one that was palpable in the sense that it felt to me like most everybody in the room realized what you were doing and you didn't introduce it. I mean, mm-hmm. as I recollect, you didn't say anything about what the song you're about to sing That's right. or introduce it. There's a quiet moment and you sang the song and I feel emotion to talking about, it, but it's like everybody realized this holy moment and like everybody was with you. Mm. Yeah. It was really beautiful. That's certainly uh, what it felt like on stage. You know, sometimes artists have to take a chance and to be vulnerable. And my manager, he did not know I'd written the song. And he sent me a really thoughtful email. They got the following morning after I wrote it. And he said, hey, I, it's not really my place to, to ask you this so you can tell me. But he said, I, you know, you're, you, I think your fans have earned the right to know about your story with Jay. I don't think your fans really know that part of you very much. They may know it sort of tangentially. but And obviously I said, well, oddly enough, I wrote the song last night. You know, <laughs> so it's really sort of serendipitous exchange between he and I. But that felt true at the Ryman that my fans have sort of engaged my music in a way that feels sort of sacred. Like I get these letters and notes from people about your song was played at my father's funeral or your song was played at our wedding or your song was mm. playing when my wife gave birth to our child or, mm. you know what more lighthearted stuff like you're on the playlist my wife listened to in our most intimate moments. You know? <laughs> um, we get all those sort of notes from people because we're not a radio band. People don't come to us through pop culture. Yeah. It's, it's sort of in the, in the mainstream, they come to us through articles or, you know, TV shows or friend of a friend, but they're not getting fed our music through popular radio formats, et cetera. So that sort of engenders trust because people feel like they sort of discovered us. Mm-hmm. And so, also, the music has sort of always been personally narrative for me. And so it felt like they have asked for this sort of without meaning to. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to entrust them with this piece of me that feels really vulnerable. I also, oh, man, that song came out about a month before the record. And I wrote a few things about it, just like, hey, this is a song by my brother that I lost when I was a kid. And if you've ever experienced loss, too, like this is for you man for the next like 24 hours all i did was just read instagram because everybody was sharing like these uh stories of, of their losses mm-hmm. and how they felt like there wasn't a song that helped them sort of put it in a perspective or in a, put words and emotions to that experience i read every single one of them tried to reply to as many of them as i could but it also just made me really like keenly aware that everybody has walked through hell and loss and tragedy and it's a miracle that we're all sort of able to function in light of all of that. There's a bit of joy and companionship in that experience with strangers. And it was really, uh, probably the, my favorite thing that's ever happened to me in my career Hmm. was getting all of those stories. Hmm. You know, like if you're willing to tell your story, Mr. Songwriter guy, who I don't know personally, well then I'll tell you mine too. And uh, it's sort of a fragile and precious experience to, to be given that opportunity. Yeah. As I just said there, my first time to hear the song alongside my wife, Laura, at the Ryman was a sacred moment. And then Drew agreed to tape the song there in the studio that week with us. And watching him up close, pouring his heart out, I do think it was one of the most beautiful and moving things I've seen or heard. You can hear here for yourself. I was standing on the sidewalk The wind swept me off the ground Flying like an airplane It felt like the speed of sound Past the moon, through the darkness It took me back in time I landed on my old front porch In 1999 There was joy in the kitchen but sadness in the eyes all the people standing around 
Telling stories I recognized Almost 20 years Since the last time we spoke We were reading at the airport And I was laughing at your jokes And you You never leave my heart Never leave my heart I saw myself talking to old friends I haven't seen in years One moved away to L.A. One's a real estate financier The reverend held court in the corner Mom cried with all who came And when I went to bed that evening I had never felt so strange And you, you never leave my heart You never leave my heart Drew Holcomb. Thanks, Drew. Thanks for having me. Grateful for you and grateful for your good words and your songs and melodies and the gift it is in the world. Thank you. Means a lot. You've been listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, The Good Life, and our interview with Drew Holcomb and about his life and about his album Dragons, available wherever you listen to fine music. Our thanks to all the stellar team that makes this podcast possible. Christy Bragg, Jacob Lewis, Ashley Bain, Leslie Thompson, Tom Anderson, Carrie Harmon, Kara Fox, Zach and Maggie White. Drew's sessions at the Sound Emporium were engineered by Joe Trentacosti. Thanks, Joe. And our band that day comprised Scott Mulvahill, Chris Brown, Brian Sutton, Aubrey Haney, Sierra Hull, and Jeff Taylor. Thanks for listening, and peace be unto thee. The Tokens Podcast is a production of Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studios. Oh, God.